I would like to now call the meeting to order and welcome you to the Interior Savings Annual General Meeting. My name is Rob Shura and I'm the chair of the Board of Directors. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the tr traditional unceded ter territory of the Salix Ocean Okanagan Nation and their peoples. In addition to those attending here in Kelowna, we know there are others joining us from near and far, and we want to acknowledge that the traditional owners, past and present, of those lands as well. We would also like to welcome the members attending from Prince George, as this is their very first Interior Savings Credit Union, and they're on that camera just over there, so we'll wave hello to Prince George and whoever else is uh, from out of town. The rules of order for the meeting are included in your kits, and for those of you participating virtually on the website, with your other meeting documents. Because many of you are participating virtually, there may be approximately a 10 to 15 second time lag between what's being presented here in the room and what the virtual participants might see on their screens. So I will intentionally pause for a few seconds at various points in this presentation to ensure we don't get too far ahead of the people online. If you are participating virtually and have a question regarding the AGM, we ask that you submit it via the questions tab on your screen. There may be a chat tab as well, but we'd prefer you don't use that. Use the questions tab, and our colleagues over here will forward the questions to us. As questions are visible to all meeting attendees, please ensure that no personal account details are included other than your name and question. We'll do our best to answer your questions tonight, but if we're unable to answer them during the meeting, or if your question pertains to your personal account, we will follow up with you, with you later this week. Please remember to include both your name and your branch when submitting a question. So 50 members are required for a quorum at our AGM, and I'll ask our Corporate Secretary, Chris Schwark, if we have confirmed that a quorum has been achieved. Thank you, Chris. So I declare a quorum is present for the meeting. I, I will now introduce the head table on the top tier, starting at my right, is Karen Hawes, Acting President and CEO. Beside her is Chris Schwark, Acting Corporate Secretary. To her right is Liza Curran, Vice Chair of the Board. Then Bruce Tisdale, Chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. And finally, Stacy Fenwick, Chair of the Nominations and Elections Committee. On the next tier down below here, uh, from their left, my left, to your right, <laughs> Ken Christian, Elmer Epp, Aniela Florshinsky, Don Grant, Carolyn Grover, Daphne Nelson, Shelley Sanders, and Sandy Watt. On a personal note, I would like to thank the board for their service and support during this past year. Your board has worked hard this year, especially since most of our meetings were held virtually with COVID keeping us from meeting in person. In fact, just two weeks ago, I met several of the board members for the first time. I would especially like to recognize long-standing board member Don Grant, who is leaving the board after 28 years of service. Don, put your hand up, please. Give me, let's congratulate Don. Don joined the Interior Savings Board in 1994, and he has previously chaired the board and has been chair of our Investment and Lending Committee for the past four years, providing excellent stewardship for our members' deposits and loans. Don's easygoing manner and insightful questioning personify the role of a good member, that is, nose in, fingers out. I will personally miss Don's wise counsel, as he has been a great help to me in my first year as chair, and I wish both Don and his wife Linda a happy and rewarding life after Interior. The entire board, Don, is indebted to you, to you for your leadership over these many years, and thank you for your service. I would also like to welcome the guests in attendance at this meeting, and thank you for taking the time out of your, uh, your busy schedules to attend the meeting, including Dylan Switzer from FH&P Lawyers, who will be our parliamentarian for the meeting, and Darcy Ha from Myers Norris Penny, or MNP, who will provide the auditor's report later in the meeting. Also in attendance, but probably online, are represented from the BC Financial Services Authority, our regulator, I believe uh, Gavin, Derek, and Tony are all out there somewhere in the ether. Uh, Bill Corbett from Stabilization Central Credit Union, 
from uh, PRA, one of our support organizations. Um, Peter, last name? Reimer, thank you, Peter, sorry about that. Uh, Luigi from Cumis, which is the credit union's life insurance partner. And we, re we also reached out to many of our credit union colleagues from across the province. And I believe among others that we have representatives in attendance from GNF Financial in Burnaby and Coastal Community in Nanaimo. So the formal notice of the annual general meeting was distributed to the members in September of 2021 when the call for nominations for the Board of Directors package was distributed. The minutes of the 2021 annual general meeting are included in your kits and were also included in the meeting package in the email confirming your registration. So given that, I'm declaring the minutes approved as circulated. And I declare there is also no business arising from the minutes. The chair's report is next. Um, the full chair's report is included on page four of the credit union's annual 2021 annual report. I'm going to provide a few highlights from that report. So amid a year of forest fires, floods, heat domes, the heartbreaking discovery of unmarked graves at former Indian residential schools and an ongoing global pandemic, Interior Savings held fast to our commitment of making a positive difference in our members' lives and in our communities. The credit union remains strong and ready to help our members and communities move forward together. Thanks to the continued support of our members, in 2021, our assets grew to $2.9 billion and earnings from operations were ahead of budget at, at 15.5 million. We returned nearly $3.4 million to members in the form of cash, rewards, dividends, and over 500 bursaries, and invested another half million in vital community programs, services, and supports. So here are some of the highlights from the past year. Following a favorable vote, Spruce Credit Union officially moved, merged with Interior Savings on January 1st, 2022. We're thrilled to welcome former Spruce Credit Union employees and members to Interior Savings, and I'd like you to welcome them with me. We now serve over 77,000 members from 23 branches in 15 different communities in the interior of BC and manage over $6.2 billion in deposits, loans, and wealth management assets. In 2021, we opened a new branch in Penticton and launched a digital assistant on our website. We also worked to build our capability to serve members safely and securely through text messaging. During the better part of the year, Preparations were completed to launch system improvements that will give us a more comprehensive picture of our members' financial health. This will help us ensure they are on track to realize their financial goals. We also launched a low-rate eco-loan for electrical vehicles, electric vehicles, piloted a new prepaid MasterCard, introduced enhancements and member discounts for travel insurance, and improved technology for faster loan approvals and lines of credit for business members. Our employees are the face of our credit union, key to the outstanding member satisfaction rating that we receive year after year. Maintaining a capable, engaged, and committed workforce that innovates for the future means committed investment in training and development. In 2021, we laid the groundwork for a new performance management system and provided training on how to lead effectively in a, re a remote work environment. And as you can imagine, some of our employees are still working from home and we're trying to accommodate that in every way we can. We're all, we also help nurture the development of our up and coming leaders through our Young Leaders Program. In 2021, with a mixture of curiosity, courage and commitment, our young leaders led our organization a in a series of health is wealth events and challenges, launched an exec for a day program, encouraged process improvements with their kill a silly rule program, hosted TED Talks, which I think is in honor of our uh, chief operating officer, and launched an organization-wide mentorship program. We also developed a new remote work policy enabling employees in suitable roles to continue working from home or in some sort of a hybrid arrangement. 
Navigating the second year of a pandemic with one natural disaster after another, we banded together to help our members and communities move forward while also exploring ways we can help to build a brighter, more inclusive and sustainable future. Our 2021 Community Investment Report provides information about how we responded to the challenges faced by our communities in 2021. In 2021, we also joined the Social Purpose Institute of the United Way as we worked to understand the critical issues facing our members and communities to identify opportunities to leverage our strengths, skills, and the work we do every day to tackle these major challenges. We began the task of defining, defining an environmental social and governance or ESG strategy that will help focus our efforts on making a meaningful and tangible difference in our communities. After a hiatus due to COVID, we were able to bring back our moonlight movie tour to many of our communities and celebrate our day of difference by closing early and sending all 500 plus employees into the community to lend a helping hand. It is with both sadness and deep gratitude that we remember Roli Caccioni, who served the board for 28 years. In honor of his legacy, the credit union contributed $10,000 to the Central Okanagan Bursary and Scholarship Society. And in addition, each year we will continue to support the educational aspirations of Interior Savings Young Leaders with our own Roli Caccioni Young Leaders Bursary. So in closing, on behalf of Interior Savings Board of Directors, we would like to thank our members for your ongoing support and loyalty and for empowering us to make a difference in our members' lives and our communities. We would also like to express our sincere appreciation to Kathy Conway, Interior Savings President and CEO, who announced her retirement effective March 22nd. And I believe Kathy is looking in through the online connection. So Kathy, thank you, thank you. For the past 20 years, Kathy has helped lead our credit union through incredible growth, and she has done so with courage, compassion, and a dedication to providing a different kind of banking that puts people at the center of everything we do. We wish Kathy continued health and much happiness in her retirement. So that's my CEO's report. And you know, even prior to uh, Kathy Conway's retirement in March of 22, the board had been busy finding a worthy successor to Kathy. I'm gonna make a brief announcement after the formal program tonight with an update on our CEO search activities. But in the meantime, I'll now call upon acting president and CEO Karen Hawes to present the CEO's report. Karen. Well, good evening, everybody. It's uh, really nice to see some faces out in the room and actually have that human touch. It's been the last two years that we've had it virtually. I do know that we have a hybrid meeting tonight. So those who are uh, connecting in virtually and those who are in the room, welcome to our AGM. I do want to recognize Gene Krillman in the room. Uh, he was one of our senior uh, vice president members that just recently retired. So I just want to say hi, Gene, and, and thanks for coming to the AGM. So on the next slide, we have a little token to uh, Prince George. So those who have not been to Prince George, this is a, a bridge that goes over the Fraser River. Now, my history tells me it was built in 1914, but if there's anybody out there from Prince George who disagrees with my history, please by all means send me a message in the chat. So that was put up there to basically provide a special welcome to our members that are joining us for the first time from Prince George to the AGM. Our merger, as the chair had explained, uh, had took place in January. And really it was designed to have the best of both these credit unions come together. We actually felt that there was a cultural and values alignment between these two organizations. We have much to do in regards to integrating the two systems, but I can say that being placed in Prince George, going to see the employees in Prince George, it is a match made in heaven. So the, for those attending uh, the meeting today, and I apologize to those attending virtually, you would notice that you got a packet, a batch of coffee when you came in. That is actually a batch of coffee that was made by a small business in Prince George. So, we, so tomorrow morning when you have your coffee, please raise a cup of coffee to our new members to Interior Savings. So while preparing to welcome the community of Prince George into our credit union last year, we wrapped our arms around many 
of our communities who face particularly challenging years. Our chair has mentioned the floods and the, the fires. It's hard to believe it's been a few months since unrelenting rain caused rivers across the southern BC to spill their banks. Many of our communities, Merritt and the other communities around them, really suffered. So we did the best that we could. We actually deferred loans and we had our insurance team who did an awesome job of working with our members in each of those communities to get them the access to emergency relief. We even had a truckload of Interior Savings employees that put buckets in their trucks, dry vacs in their trucks, shovels in their trucks to help our members and the community start to clean up and to rebuild. In 2021, we also saw the forest fires that actually impacted Lytton the worst. And so what we, had to, what we ended up doing was we put a relief fund together and we asked you, our members to donate to that relief fund. And you did. And Interior Savings said that we would match the dollars that came in from our members. And we actually reached $7,000 that went to the United Way to continue with the relief efforts in Lytton. And of course, a discovery that opened eyes across the nation and was actually felt across the world was the discovery of thousands of unmarked graves at former Indian residential schools, including 215 at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. At Interior Savings, our hearts were broken and we invited our members to join us in donating to the Indian Residential School Survivor Society. That is a group that works on healing intergenerational survivors. And in the weeks leading up to National Truth and Reconciliation, we did our best to educate ourselves through webinars and information to, in the pursuit of understanding the injustices experienced by the residential school survivors and all the indigenous peoples. In 2021, we worked in, as a community of people and as a community of members to face these challenges together while working to build a strong, more resilient and more inclusive future. That led into our thinking around our ESG. In our current strategic plan, which covers 2021 to 2023, our goals focus on the pillars of financial responsibility, member goals, member financial health and trust, ongoing automation to improve our processes and empowering our employees. We also added a new pillar, as the chair had mentioned earlier, and that was our ESG pillar. And as we become a member of the Social Purpose Institute, we are learning more and more about ESG. This is our first year that we started on this journey, so we hope to bring lots more information to you next year at the AGM. One of the strengths that we have at Interior Savings, or one of the things that we celebrate, is our employee culture. And as you can see, this is a dashboard of our employee survey. So two years ago, we had to stand before you and say that our employee culture or employee engagement rating had gone down slightly. It went down to a rating of 7.85 out of 10. So that was down to do with the, the banking conversion and the pandemic. So we all worked hard together to work on focus areas to see how we could better improve our organization. And I'm really proud to say that that score went up to 8.5 for 2021. Part of building and sustaining the culture it's not just the leaders we have today, but it's those leaders of tomorrow. And as our chair had mentioned, we do have a young leaders group. That young leaders group came into play in 2020, and I can tell you the killer silly rule, or the questions they ask, or the events that they put on, really does have our minds opening and has us thinking slightly differently. So I could stand up here and share with you what they do, but I thought it'd be really cool if we could have a member of our young leaders group just come up and share a few words with you. So Carly, if you could come up and share with the membership. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> the Interior Savings Young Leaders was founded in 2020. We're currently comprised of a committee of nine individuals under the age of 40 who work to build collaboration, development, and leadership skills throughout our organization. With the support we've seen from our subcommittees and positive staff engagement, we've continued to accomplish and succeed in all of our endeavors. This, of course, would not be possible without the continued support we receive from our executive sponsors. To that end, in the past two years, we have created several beneficial programs for interior saving staff, some of which our board chair had mentioned. Our Roli Caccioni bursary has been awarded twice to recipients pursuing educational opportunities. 
We created an ongoing internal mentorship program through collaboration with the Canadian Credit Union Association to share knowledge between staff within our organization with both a peer-to-peer -peer and an executive stream available. We've hosted several internal virtual events to promote team building across departments and branches, from Oliver to Clearwater and in the future to Prince George. Our Executive for a Day program successfully launched with positive feedback from our two recipients so far. This provides an opportunity for staff to spend a day in the life of a C-suite executive. We created a Look Before You Leap program to allow staff to shadow and try out different organizational roles before committing to them. This has now been adopted organizational-wide by our learning and development team. Our Accountability Buddies program had staff partner together with another staff member to work on their own personal goals. The intention of this program was to build personal accountability and create an inter-staff community. We have also recently created a quarterly newsletter and website to keep staff apprised of our upcoming events and ongoing initiations. We hope to put more events on in the future and continue fostering our goals of the Young Leaders Program. Thank you for the opportunity to share an update for our committee. Thank you, Carly. And that's just one of the many young leaders that we have in our organization. So I'd like to share a little bit of member service highlights, but there's no better person to do that than our Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. So I'd like to ask Ted to come up and share a few of those highlights with you. Thanks, Karen. Good job, Carly. I just checked with Trevor and neither one of us are eligible for your group for some time now. Anyway, um, when we talk about member experience, every year we check in with the members and we do a survey uh, of all our membership to understand how are we doing from your perspective, where we're doing well and where we could improve. Once again, in almost all areas, our members rated us as excellent or very good. And again, we're consistently performing above the benchmark of other financial institutions, often referred to as non-credit unions. You may have heard of them. Uh, while there's something to celebrate, while that's something to celebrate, we also want to acknowledge that there was a subtle dip last year in the number of, in, in a number of measures, particularly around meeting member needs while making banking easy and enjoyable. Hard to do, but something that we try and do every day. You can see it on the slide there where they, they drop just a little bit. You'll notice the boxes in with the purple numbers, those are the benchmarks of generally financial institutions in general. The bar charts are, are our scores on the same metrics, considerably higher. Uh, we attribute the dip last year, and it, and it been on some measures the year before, primarily to the challenging year we came through. The pandemic certainly has uh, had impact on the way we deliver service, the rules we follow, and our members as well, as members traveled from store to store, from institution to institution, things were slower, things were more difficult to get done in a quick and easy manner, something we strive to do. At the same time, the results remain excellent, and we came through the have come through and are still coming through operating in a pandemic at the tail end of a major banking system conversion akin to uh, performing a heart transplant on a living patient while they're jogging and uh, having it keep going. So degree of difficulty there for sure. While there were certainly some bumps in the road as we transitioned through all those different things that happened, we'd like to thank all members for your patience and support and thank all staff for the excellent job you did in taking care of the members. Another important measure we consider is our members' trust in us. What we do is a trusting business. What we heard last year was very encouraging. When it comes to having our members' best interests at heart, 95%, say that again, 95% of our members rated us positively on, that, on those metrics, with more than half saying we're better than most. Thank you. That's outstanding, and we're glad to earn that trust every day. In 2021, we ran a number of focus groups with members. Unsurprisingly, what we heard from members was that their expectations for choice, speed, and convenience continue to be paramount for their day-to-day -day banking. The bar is raised every year, and we look forward to helping to meet those challenges with you. We also heard members reaffirm how important personalized advice is, having an expert to help them articulate their financial goals, point out common pitfalls to avoid, and build a plan to help reach those goals in a, in a good way. It's more than just building a plan. For us, it's about identifying when and how often we want to check in with you, the type of advice, making it relevant for you individually. 
In 2022, we'll be launching a new financial health assessment tool and the supporting content on our website, inviting you to book an appointment with a financial health coach. I think you may just have heard from one just a few minutes ago, Carly. Carly is a financial health coach. She's very good at it. And soon, our employees will have access to a new customer relationship management software system that is far improved over the systems we have now, which will make it easier us to deliver that experience and timely personalized advice that you're all looking for. May the 4th for many people is Star Wars Day. Not anymore. May the 4th now is Penticton Day. Because on May 4th, 2021, Interior Savings opened a new branch in Penticton. Pretty nice, eh? All right. So if you're in Penticton, stop by and say, hey, we're on the south end of town. We have a great team there. They're doing a great job establishing ourselves in the community. We're looking forward to growing financially healthy relationships in Penticton. Matter of fact, before we opened that branch, we had many, many members already living in Penticton, so it's a nice fit. As Karen noted and Rob, we merged with Spruce Credit Union, and with that, Spruce members gain access to our 21 branches that were part of interior savings across the Thompson Okanagan, better rates, more choices of products, and more ways to do their banking. Members of interior savings will soon have two additional branches to serve them when you're visiting Prince George. For the moment, former Spruce Credit Union members will have noticed minimal changes to their banking. Over the next 12 months, we'll integrate our operations. And the Spruce Credit Union name will shift to become interior savings on all the branding. The transition will be gradual so we can minimize disruption to you as much as possible. By roughly this time next year, we expect the integration to be complete so that any interior savings member, Thompson, Okanagan, Prince George, or wherever, can have the same great service in any of our 23 locations. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Karen for closing comments. So thank you both Carly and Ted, that was great to sort of share the highlights of 2021. So before I wrap up, I want to take this opportunity to share a couple of thank yous. I want to thank the entire team of Interior Savings Credit Union and Interior Insurance. We've been through so many things over the last two years with the pandemic, the floods, the fires. And I have to say, you are members of those communities too. Yet you put our members first and you put your volunteerism first. And I don't know how to describe our gratitude just other than to say thank you. And to our board of directors, uh, who have provided a great amount of support over the last couple of years, and I can tell you they have worked extremely hard doing the CEO search. I have been alongside them, and they have worked long hours, and we all should be very proud of the time and effort that they put into it. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to Kerry, who is going to be joining our board. Uh, we know Kerry, and I uh, just want to say you better roll up those sleeves because we're going to get busy here soon. And I would also like to say that I have never known a time that I have been working at Interior Savings Credit Union where I have not seen Don Grant on the board. And I know that our chair has recognized him already, but I think on behalf of Interior Savings staff, we want to say thank you. We know that Interior Savings runs through your veins, so we know you will not be far, Don, and we look forward to seeing you in the community. On a personal level, I'd just like to thank my teams, and in particular, Ted and Trevor, as well as my husband and my family, for supporting me as taking on this role as acting president and CEO. It's been a lot of work, and there has been times they've had to talk me off the ledge, so I truly appreciate it. Thank you. And saving the best for last. That is our members. We thank you so much. We have been through so much together, and you have stood by our sides as we've gone through the pandemic, as we've gone through fires in communities and floods in our communities. And we are so very grateful that you've chosen us to be your financial partner. As we head into the latter quarters of 2022, no matter what comes our way, we will work on keeping your interests as well as those of our employees and communities at the heart of every decision that we make. I'd like to thank you for your time this evening. And with that, I'm going to pass you on to our Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Trevor Trombley, to share the financial results with you. Thank you. I'm not sure what that look was for, Karen, but thank you. <laughs> now for the final event. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Karen. It is so great to be able to share this year's financial presentation 
concurrently in person and online. And with the changing digital landscape, who knows if next year I'll be presenting in the metaverse. <laughs> and if you don't know what the metaverse is, you're not alone. And those of you who have witnessed the AGM presentation of years past, you will know that I have developed a love-hate relationship with hand sanitizer. So I will not make any hand-eye contact for the rest of this presentation. So with that out of the way, let's get started. First and foremost, I want to clarify that the figures in the annual report, the financial statements, and my financial presentation represents interior savings without any inclusion of the uh, newly acquired uh, Spruce Credit Union results. I will share some key figures relating to the acquisition near the end of my presentation, but wanted to ensure that you are aware that the 2021 figures are before the merger. The content of what I am presenting tonight can be found on pages 9 through 16 of the annual report that you received this evening, and primarily focusing on the management discussion and analysis section. To augment this, I'll be providing additional commentary throughout my presentation, as well as the slides you'll see uh, before you. The presentation tonight will cover off a recap of some key highlights from 2021, including a review of key growth and financial results, member distributions, a quick look at the numbers for the newly acquired Spruce Credit Union, and I'll finish off with a look ahead at 2022. In terms of economic highlights, despite operating in year two of the pandemic, I have noted the following observations. For the most part, equities experienced a strong bull market with the TSX up 21.7% in 2021. And if anybody looked at the markets over the last week or so, we may have given most of that back. But nonetheless, we're talking about 2021. And while 2021 did start off with very low interest rates, we did start to see a rise in rates towards the latter part of the year. It probably comes as no surprise that 2021 also had record setting home sales in terms of the number of units and price increases. It's also noteworthy that the BC growth rates outperformed many of the national growth rates across most uh, measurable categories. And lastly, the very low provincial and regional unemployment rates has put staffing pressure on many local businesses, including interior, sa interior savings. <clears throat> Within these conditions though, interior savings experienced strong loan and deposit growth, significant increase in wealth net sales, and record-setting non-interest lending revenues. But I may be getting ahead of myself, so let's walk through the highlights together. So we'll move on to the uh, asset and loan growth chart. First up, overall consolidated assets grew 96 million to reach $2.9 billion. And in terms of the composition of assets, this chart shows relatively little change in other assets, whereas the majority of the growth was in total loans, which grew by 104 million, or a growth of 4.6%, and is represented by the dark green or dark blue uh, bar on this chart. In 2021, we experienced strong mortgage growth through a combination of branch, broker, and mobile mortgage specialist activity. More specifically, retail mortgage origination volumes were in excess of a half a billion, that's a B for billion, a half a billion dollars representing new home purchases, refinances, and renewals, resulting in net retail member loan growth of nearly 111 million, or 6.4%. This member loan growth was partially offset by the continued expected paydowns of non-member loans of 56 million. And with regards to commercial lending, we had a strong growth year of nearly $50 million or 11.5%. The majority of this growth is in residential construction loans with a lot more in the works for future funding. Our success in member loan growth is due in large part to you, our members, by entrusting interior savings with your deposits that we can fund loans with. This past year, we continued to see growth in member deposits to the tune of $187 million as pandemic restrictions and conditions in continue to impact consumer spending. And while this growth is also a testament to our ongoing commitment to offering competitive deposit products and rates, and I'll withhold the commercial for now, uh, it is noteworthy to point out that members did alter uh, their deposit behavior with respect to deposit composition in this low rate environment. 
More specifically, we witnessed a significant migration of maturing term deposit balances into lower cost demand deposits such as checking and savings. So with strong loan and deposit growth, how did we fare overall? Well, let's start with a summary review of the financial results with this condensed statement of income. I'll provide a brief summary of the changes and then uh, we'll just move on to, there should be a chart with a table of figures and it'll be titled Condensed Income Statement. There we go, thank you. I'll provide a brief summary of the changes and then we'll dig in a bit deeper into some of the key areas. Firstly, financial margin of 57.2 million was an improvement of 1.9 million or 3.4% from 2020, which I'll expand on further in a subsequent slide. Next, the provision for loan losses was decreased by 350,000 based on our positive year-end assessment of the existing loan loss provision as being adequate relative to the underlying credit risks. Overall, our total loan loss provision as a percentage of total loans is comparable uh, to prior years and industry peers. Other income was up 1.1 million, which I'll explain shortly. And lastly, operating expenses were held at an increase of 1.4 million or 2.3%. The net effect of all these changes was that operating income increased by 1.9 million, coming in at 15.5 million for the year. This resulted in member distributions, as you heard earlier, to nearly $3.4 million. And after all the dust settles, we reported net income of 10.2 million, which is an increase of $1.6 million over 2020. Now let's, live a, let's have a bit of a closer look at the main components outlined in the consolidated statement of income. Starting with uh, financial margin, in 2021 we saw an increase of $1.9 million, being the net of several main areas largely affected by the very low interest rate environment. Firstly, this had an impact on lower interest income on loans, considering the volume of mortgage repricing at these lower interest rates, and also on our investment portfolio, causing lower yields on excess liquidity investments. Overall, interest revenues declined by $8 million. This reduction in revenue, however, was surpassed by a $10 million reduction in interest expense. This stemmed from the member deposit composition change I noted earlier, as well as a $93 million reduction we had in our borrowings. The combination of these changes resulted in the increase in financial margin dollars. And with the strong equities market in 2021 and the lower interest rate environment, we continued to help members with sourcing alternative investments. Our wealth management division experienced very strong growth in net sales of $82 million through its investment advisory services and the continued success of the Investment Solutions Center service. Net sales combined with the strong equities market in 2021 resulted in the value of total assets under management increasing to 850 million. Overall, our wealth management services represents 20% of our total other income category. So speaking of other income, you will note that this category increased $1.2 million in 2021. Details of the composition of, and year-over-year -year comparisons is provided on page 54 of the annual report. But I'll summarize the most notable increases here. Firstly, record-breaking member loan fee revenues increased nearly $4 million. This was entirely driven by the sheer volume of mortgage activity and members triggering mortgage prepayment penalties in this low rate environment. Secondly, the, sec the significant volume of new commercial loan applications were approved and the associated fees for those originations contributed to the excess. And lastly, the increase in volume related wealth management and creditor insurance commissions was related to the additional 2021 activity. The most notable reduction in other income year over year relates to the one-time transitional gain that we reported in 2020 for our liquidity deposit portfolio. And while not materially different in 2021, we do anticipate there will be some reduction in income from insurance in 2022 as the impact of ICBC changes, wildfires and floods work their way through the insurance industry. Moving on to expenses. The overall cost of operating the credit union in 2021 was $64.2 million. 
an overall increase of the 1.4 million or 2.3%. Operating expenses include salaries and benefits, branch facilities, computer system costs, and costs to meet regulatory and administrative compliance. And with the low provincial and regional unemployment rate, we too experienced higher than expected staff vacancies throughout 2021, contributing to salaries and benefits expense essentially being unchanged year over year, despite annual cost increases. Therefore, the $1.4 million increase in total operating expenses was really the net of an aggregate reduction in data processing, depreciation and occupancy costs of a half a million dollars, offset by the notable year-over-year -year increase of $1.8 million in the general operating and administrative category. Details of this are also found on page 54 of the annual report. But more specifically, while there are some increases and decreases across multiple expense categories within the general category, the noteworthy items contributing to this year-over-year -year increase was a $1.2 million increase in deposit insurance premiums, as the 2020 premiums were lower than expected due to the CUTIC fund providing BC credit unions with some premium relief. The expense level we have now in 2021 is reflective of a return to more standard base level premiums. Additionally, increases are noted in professional fees of an increase of about 400,000 year over year for merger related legal and consulting costs and $350,000 in volume driven business development costs. And as noted previously in the presentation, we ended the year with operating income of 15 and a half million. And based on this result, the board approved distributions to you, our members, of approximately 22% of operating income. This was set aside in the, for distribution in the form of bursary dollars, dividends, and patronage uh, distributions. And since 2002, members have received nearly $71 million of profits returned. On the heels of member distributions is a quick review of members' equity and the overall capital position of the credit union. Since credit unions are owned by its members, the capital of a credit union is largely comprised of members' equity, which is primarily retained earnings or cumulative profits. During last year's AGM presentation, I mentioned we planned to put our capital to greater use. And the growth in investments, commercial lending, and residential mortgages mentioned earlier did just that. These growth areas consume capital, which is reflected in part by the decrease in this capital ratio from 2020. Interior savings' capital remains strong and one of the highest compared to similar sized credit unions in this province. As noted in my introduction, the entirety of the financial statements contained in the annual report and the presentation we've just uh, witnessed thus far has excluded any financial figures related to the former Spruce Credit Union. Therefore, I'd like to spend a few moments highlighting some key figures uh, for the benefit of the broader interior savings attendees and those joining us from Prince George. Effective January 1, 2022, interior savings acquired the assets and liabilities of Spruce Credit Union. For some context, the total assets acquired were 196 million, which is represented by nearly 163 million in member loans. And in addition to this, total member deposits acquired were $184 million. In terms of the wealth management portfolio, Prince George members have entrusted nearly $25 million in assets under management. And lastly, a general recap of financial results are that Spruce's 2021 operating income before merger related adjustments was approximately $1.2 million, up from $920,000 the year before. The 2022 financial statements of interior savings which will be presented at next year's AGM will reflect the combined uh, financial results of the combined operations. This brings me to my final topic, a brief outlook on 2022. I mean, the last week or so has pretty much ruined my presentation, but uh, for the most part, this is what we're looking towards. We expect to see moderately strong economic growth as restrictions are lifted, However, we do expect there will be some cooling on the housing sale activity caused by the affordability impact of recent increases in mortgage rates. More difficult to qualify. And as many of you know, the Bank of Canada is expected to continue prime rate increases until inflation reverts to its target, target range. 
And despite some of these headwinds, we do expect to see continued elevated housing prices and activity in the desirable Thompson Okanagan market areas. We are additionally excited for the expanded commercial and retail growth opportunities in the Prince George and surrounding market area. In closing, I just want to thank you for your support of Interior Savings in helping us to strengthen our local money for local good purpose. Thank you. Well, thank you to Karen, Trevor, Ted, and Carly. Good job, Carly. Uh, so I declare the chair, uh, CEO, and financial reports adopted as received. And the board, on behalf of the members, are very pleased with these re results, especially under such difficult, difficult operating circumstances. Um, I now call on Karen Hawes, our acting president and CEO, to address any questions you may have regarding either the CEO's report or the financial report. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Please come to the mic. Identify yourself and the branch that you represent. Yeah, I think I've done this once or twice before. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Peter Anatushkin, uh, Rutland Branch. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the management and staff and board for managing another successful financial and profitable year. Also, my personal uh, congratulations to Kathy on her retirement. She's not here, I understand. Uh, and wishing her continued health and happiness and also helping us in uh, placing our credit union where it is today. Thanks also, Trevor, for your uh, good report, as usual. Uh, some of the questions you have answered, I was going to ask you. So I won't waste any more time in that particular <laughs> respect. <laughs> but uh, uh, one thing I wanted to ask is uh, interest expense on member deposits decreased uh, 8.6 million, or over 57%. Uh, is this uh, due to interest rate or uh, members uh, possibly investing elsewhere? Uh, it's a bit of both, but primarily the low interest rate environment and also uh, what happened is deposits or members have, ch have chosen to move monies out of higher cost term deposits into low or no interest rate uh, demand products like checking and savings. So there's a little bit of a parking of funds in, in lower cost deposit products for, for the better part of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, just in closing, uh, I don't know if this will be uh, quite involved or what have you. Could you just briefly comment the uh, hedge accounting? <laughs> <laughs> briefly. Uh, br briefly, uh, briefly. I, it, it could be quite involved. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, save an easy one for the end. <laughs> thanks, Mr. Anatushkin. Um, yeah, just real briefly, hedge accounting is uh, the methodology in which we report some of our fair value uh, values of our, our der derivative portfolio. So for example, we have to manage interest rate risk of the credit union, and uh, we do so through the use of sophisticated hedging instruments. Those hedging instruments or derivative contracts are do qualify for hedge accounting because they are used to hedge an item on the balance sheet that we can uh, appropriately record in, in other comprehensive income. So you'll see those valuations uh, show up and those changes in valuations show up in the section called other comprehensive income. It is simply, well, it's more complicated than simply, but it generally represents fair value presentation of those instruments, but they do over time show up in the uh, statement of operating income as they're realized. May have lost the entire crowd. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we really do like questions. Uh, anyone else want to take a stab? I understand there are no questions from the online crowd in Prince George. They're treating us pretty well tonight. No further questions then. Thank you, Trevor, very much for your responses.
Um, I'd like to now call on uh, Stacy Fenwick, Chair of the Nominations and Elections Committee, to present her report. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stacy Fenwick, and I am honored to serve on your board of directors. And as chair of the Nominations and Elections Committee, I'm here to report out the results of this year's election. In 2022, there were four positions up for election on the board, each one for a three-year term. Ken Christian, Carolyn Grover, and Daphne Nelson were all re-elected to the board. And joining us on the board is newly elected Carrie Brennan. Stand up. <laughs> Welcome, Carrie. I am very much looking forward and, uh, to working with you on the board, as is everyone else on our board. And as, uh, as chair and acting CEO Karen have already said, I want to personally thank uh, Don Grant for his dedication and service to the board for 28 years. And I've been on the board for seven years and I have learned so much from you, Don, so thank you. And that's my report. Well, thank you, Stacy. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I would also like to welcome Carrie Brennan to the Board of Interior Savings Credit Union. Carrie brings valuable previous experience with Interior Savings, and I look forward to her future contributions. In accordance with the regulatory requirements, Interior Savings Credit Union provided a copy of the condensed financial statements to all members in March. The annual report containing the financial statements have, have been posted on the Credit Union's website. We will now hear the auditor's report, and I would like to call on Mr. Darcy Haw, regional leader of the Assurance Services at MNP LLP, to present his report. Darcy? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, the most exciting part of the evening, not quite. Uh, the independent auditor's report, which is uh, included in the annual report that everyone has uh, access to. So, uh, as you would expect, a clean or unmodified audit opinion for the year ended December 31st, 2021. Uh, this report is dated March 19th, 2022, which is the date that the Board of Directors uh, approved the financial statements for issuance. So, I will read the most important part of the audit report, so if you bear with me. In our opinion, the accompanying consolidated financial statements present fairly in all material respects the consolidated financial position of the credit union as at December 31st, 2021, and its consolidated financial performance and its consolidated cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with international financial reporting standards. Thanks. I was gonna say short and sweet, but sorry, Darcy, that's just not, not fair. Um, Thank you, Darcy. Uh, I declare the auditor's report as received and it will form part of the minutes of the meeting. Thank you to MNP LLP for your continuing service to Interior Savings Credit Union. And I would like to point out that a formal motion to appoint the credit union's auditor for 2022 is not required since a motion is only required if a change to the auditor is proposed. Saying that, are there any further questions that you might have for the board or for the senior staff? Seeing none, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in our AGM. As I mentioned earlier, the Board wishes to inform the membership of our executive search activities to recruit a new CEO for Interior Savings. After six months of planning, research, interviews, and careful considerations, the Board is pleased to announce the hiring in April of 2022 of Mr. Brian Harris. If you're watching, Brian, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> the board is pleased to announce the hiring originally of Brian Harris, originally of Victoria, BC, as our new CEO. Brian comes to Interior Savings after serving in increasingly senior positions in the financial services industry and technology industries, most recently as senior vice president of one of the largest financial payments service organizations in Northern Europe. 
Brian has returned home to British Columbia with his family, and we feel very lucky to have found an individual with such broad and deep experience in the emerging world of open banking to join our credit union at such a critical juncture in our future. The board is confident that Brian has all the skills and strong leadership capabilities required to effectively and successfully navigate the emerging business and regulatory changes ahead of us, challenges. Brian is eager to start this journey at the helm of Interior Savings, and we look forward to welcoming him officially on his planned start date of June 20th, 2022. In the meantime, the board would like to express its deep gratitude to Karen Hawes, our Senior Vice President of Culture and Technology, for taking on the additional responsibilities of the Acting President and CEO until Brian becomes available. We're also very grateful for the extra effort the rest of the senior management team have and will continue to contribute as we go through this important leadership transition. We all wish Karen and her team much success over the next few months. And to Brian Harris, our incoming CEO, the board pledges our full support to ensure that Interior Savings and its members will continue to be successful for many years to come. Finally, as all items on tonight's agenda have been addressed, I declare that the 2021 Interior Savings Annual General Meeting is adjourned, and thank you for coming tonight.